Cool. All right. Uh, good evening. I'd like to call the January 7, 2020 Board of Selectmen's meeting to order. Can we all please stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, I don't have any announcements other than uh, Happy New Year's to everybody. I uh, hope we all had good holidays and see everybody made it back from the little break safe. So is there anybody here for anything that's not currently on our agenda? Seeing as none, uh, I will go right into a host community agreement discussion with Messis LLC uh, with Michael Hunnewell. And, you guys want to come on up? And CJ. And CJ. That was omitted from my agenda. I'd like to have the record <laughs> reflect that. No, it is in your agenda. <laughs> Steve. Um, do you guys, are you going to be able to throw, throw it up there? Or do you guys have your presentations? Uh, we have printed copies of it. Yeah. All right. So I'll just, see, just so I can see on my laptop what's going on. Do you guys don't mind? No, not at all. You can have a seat. You can have a seat. You don't need to. We're not that formal. We both can have a seat. Do I need to like speak into the microphone or anything? That's good. So, and uh, CJ, we'll let you sit down, even though you weren't on the. Uh, I know. He really is on the agenda. <laughs> I was gonna sit out of the parking lot. <laughs> if you read the agenda, first it says he wasn't sure who else was gonna be here, and then today, no, inside, inside. I just go off the top page, right? Well, you? then see, that's why you make me look bad. <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna add you on by hand. <laughs> <laughs> If we're going really formal, I'm actually kind of well, so. No one calls him that, don't <laughs> worry. Uh, let's see here, so, so good afternoon. Um, I'm Michael Honewell, this is my brother, uh, CJ Honewell. Um, just a little bit about us. So, I um, run a company called Escar LLC. So we, have th we actually have three HCAs. Um, we have approval in uh, Northbridge, uh, Watertown, and Arlington. Um, we actually originally looked at Douglas, and then we found out that we got Watertown, and we couldn't pursue anymore. So my brother approached me. He said, my brother's actually been working for years in cannabis POS systems. He found out about this, and he said he'd like to get involved. He'd like to run his own business here. So I said um, that I'd like to help him out. I can only consult. That's, that's it per the state regulation. Um, I have no interest in having this affect my other permits right now. So uh, I just wanted to clarify that for the council immediately. But this is, this is my brother's business. It's 100% owned by him. I'm just, I've done this process before, the HCA process and the permitting process. So I said I'd help out. So here we are. Um, so just a little bit about the two founders. It's uh, John Paul Aldi, who's um, actually we all grew up together. So John Paul, uh, we all lived in a little town in Old Sabre, Connecticut. Uh, John Paul is, uh, does year, years of property management experience. So he runs a, um, a company out of Connecticut that does large real estate jobs for both restaurants and condominiums. Uh, he also got um, New York University, he got his um, MS in uh, finance. Uh, he's consulted with several, for years he did a lot of investment consulting for Japanese firms overseas. Um, so he is managing obviously the real estate and financials for the company. Um, he couldn't be here today because his wife is at a wake and he's stuck with a three month year old kid. So unless Douglas gets a daycare program, <laughs> he couldn't make it. But CJ, um, I mean, you want, I don't want to steal your thunder, so you can talk a little bit about yourself if you want. Yeah, so I come to the business essentially bringing more of the back-end um, logistics side of it. So um, obviously it's at a very exciting time for all, and that's why we're, I want to jump into this, but um, where my passion more lies is kind of set, like setting up the actual infrastructure for the systems involved so whether that's the pos systems connecting the financials all the way down to the seed to sale um that's essentially my passion with that and you know, this is 
of us minor parlay. I've run some other businesses in the past um, and held some up for Salesforce. Obviously, with the new industry of marijuana, it's a little bit different, but a lot of passion involved. And so, um, if we go to the next slide, we can kind of talk about the logistics. Right now, there's 80 retailer licenses um, that have provisional approval. The reason why we pointed that out is because we wanted to show that these are basically all the other firms that are going to open up before us, pending some type of incident. Um, basically, they're in the state. state's giving them approval to move through. Um, these are the various different locations. Um, some of them are already open, specifically 32 of these 80 are already open, but that kind of gives you an idea of where these different businesses are. If you actually look at the map, you'll notice um, that this area actually doesn't have a lot of provisional activity, which is good for the town. Uh, you can actually pull from, even though there's a bunch of firms in Webster, there's some roadways that connect uh, to the Connecticut and Rhode Island area, which is also beneficial for the town. Um, I'm sure you guys already obviously all know this um, based on the ability to, uh, the way that it was structured and it seems like the town's favorable for these types of operations. So where we're proposing is at 148 Webster Street. Uh, the property is a lot owned by Rob Cherrier. It's owned in RC2, which means it's not by right, but it's through uh, committee. Um, it's a large empty lot right now. Uh, Mr. Cherrier was looking to develop it anyways um, to put up a vendor building. He approached us. We went and surveyed the property. Um, he seems to be very favorable. It looks like he can move pretty quickly through the local permitting process. Uh, he seems to know the area very well, which is all points to very positive signs for us because we don't want to be delayed we have no intention of being delayed in the town process since the state process takes so long. Um, and we can talk about that uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, what's good about the location is it sounds like there's already a retailer on the other side of town. So this would position us on the west side of town, which allows us to pull people from the lake, uh, the trailer park nearby, uh, obviously the residents of the town, um, and then actually, if you look at some of the major roadways, there's Barrelville and even uh, Thompson, which are over state lines. Um, and since those states haven't legalized recreational, uh, that location will be able to pull from those residents as well, potentially. Um, so, you know, just a, a, for, a population forecast, there's, 20, there's about 25 residents, 25,000 residents within a five mile radius of that area. It obviously pulls from different areas, but we're not counting some of the other towns. Um, even though it is a smaller town, you know, Douglas is a smaller town, it's still because of the moratoriums and not legalization in other states, it still allows this area to pull from uh, other res other residents and so this makes it an attractive loca location for revenue uh, potential revenue uh, so this so if you look at the next slide uh, this is the proposed building about 2,000 square 20 it's 2,000 square feet but we're adding a 500 foot mezzanine um, obviously one that's beneficial for security um, believe it or not uh, my wife has <laughs> actually helped with a lot of the designs for the for these cannabis stores we've seen in the past. She worked for she works for New Balance um, in their marathon division, so they typically will see a hundred thousand people in a day for some of their uh, stores. The point is, she knows how to move a lot of people, um, and so what we'll go with, we'll probably go with a holding room, uh, retail floor design. Um, if you look at the next slide, this is just some renderings uh, that, you know, when I sat down with CJ, what we kind of liked is the more organic feel. It probably won't have that green glass, but we didn't want to do, you know, to do a full rendering right now wasn't necessary. This is some of the other renderings that we've looked at. Um, the importance of a holding room is what it allows you to do is it, it increases the occupancy per the building. Um, significantly. I think, uh, I forget like retail floor space, but it's about 20, it's one person per 20 square feet if you just do pure retail, but if you add a holding room, it, it drops down to about four or five people per square foot. 
Um, so what that allows you to do is prevent loitering on the site, which is why you see a lot of these holding rooms. Um, you can also, um, what we'll do is we'll have glass areas. Uh, we've talked to Stock and Beans and what, what we've in, it, looked to implement is we'll have QR codes behind all of the glass block products. And then what you can give is you can give folks tablets or phones and it allows them to quickly stand, scan, which goes to your online. And so this drastically increases your inventory turnover. All this, what this means is you don't have land, lines outside. And I know that's been a big concern with, with different towns. So this, de this design is allowed to prevent that. Um, and so it also has a nice organic feel. It's not very kind of sterile environment. So you know, branding is, is important too. Uh, standard security protocols, key card access, 24 hour video surveillance, the holding room, uh, over 21 ID verification in uh, twice once you get in the door, once you go to pay. Um, additional security staff on weekends <coughs> for additional workflow. Uh, all these are standard in the regulations. Um, actually, I think the double IG check may not. Um, but again, the point is, you know, you look at, we try to be very conservative with a lot of our security measures because that and the POS system, because if anything goes wrong, we we don't want to, you know, there's a lot of eyeballs on this. It's not worth us to, to do, to get in trouble. And so, you know, anyone who opens these, they, they have the potential to be a very profitable business. So we want to make sure there's no reason to cut corners, which is what I'm getting at. Um, and so finally, what we're talking about with revenue projections. So this is sourced from, even though it says Nucleus One, all this data is publicly available via the CCC. Um, so our current, currently the average revenue daily per store is $64,000. That's about 20 million a, a year annually. Now, there's a couple of things. One, there's been a slight drop because of the vape ban caused a lot of people to um, not purchase vape products so that, you know, they go back to the black market. Um, that ended, so that number will probably improve. The other thing is you'll see more retailers come online. That doesn't mean that this number is proportional. Um, it, <coughs> because not everyone is driving hours to the local, to the one of the only 32, a lot of them are getting to the black market. Or if you look at other states, you see an uptick in, in people usage rate over time as they purchase the product. Um, and so, what we're, what we're really getting at here is once we think the market becomes saturated in a few years is the Douglas store will probably settle on something between one to three million in revenue. And the reason why I bring that up and the reason why we didn't do financials is what really dictates the difference between making 20 million a year and one million a year or three million a year is when we get to open with the state. And so the faster you move, the less red tape you have to go through, the um, the quicker you will realize these these revenue numbers. You know, so that's why we talked about the 80 provisional right now. Um, you know, the state. You, you look at the number of towns. You figure 20 percent the number of liquor stores. This, you're probably looking anywhere from 250 to 500 stores eventually. Um, if we get in line now, we'll probably be around the hundredth store. Um, so that kind of dictates, you know, and then eventually if Rhode Island and Connecticut legalize and the state doesn't seem to pick up their um, confirmation rate for these permits, that will obviously affect it. So that's why we tried to pick a lot that was, that, that was zoned correctly. We have a builder that, that's already ready to move forward. So we just try to emphasize that the, the time to market is kind of a, 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 big, a big point here, which we we think we're well positioned to move forward with. Um, so if, if we're, you know, if, if the Board of Selectmen um, decides to issue us an HCA, where do we go from here? And so we, ought, we have no objections to the HCA. Uh, we've reviewed the document. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's actually one of the more fair ones. Um, 
It's so you know we also know that someone else have, has already signed it, so it's not worth us. Um, we accept all the the measures, um, so we could sign it today. Uh, after that, we scheduled community outreach. We have to give people um, basically uh, the new regs are. It used to be seven days. I think it's 14 now. Um, we have to give them about two to three weeks notice. So we have we set up a meeting, get the community forum, get that signed. And then we, we immediately put the packet together and submit to the state probably two weeks after that. You know, we have to get all our ducks in a row, make sure the application's correct because you don't want it to get kicked out. And so we, um, in the meantime, what we're allowed to do is concurrently go through the local perm permitting with the town of Douglas. Um, like I said, I, you know, currently we've heard everything from a year to two years with the state. I, you know, depending on if they improve their staff, it sounds like they're going to improve their staffing. Um, so I think that number is going to start improving. Um, right now they're approving about three, three stores a month. Um, so again, we don't, you know, we don't want, you have to be very sure that you're ready to, to move forward as each step is your approved. And so after that, once we get um, approval to build, um, both with the town and the state, uh, start building, and then finally circle back again for final approvals, both with the town and the state. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. Um, if there's any questions, we're you know, we're both happy to elaborate. Um, so I leave it to the board. Just out of curiosity, you said that the HCA was um, more fair than some others you've seen. In what sense? Um, well, I mean, I'm sure everyone has seen the news articles about some of the HCAs. Um, you know, the 3% tax, every, everyone pretty much does. You know, where I've seen, you know, some egregious liberties kind of taken is, you know, specific sums of payments for no reason. Um, you know, it's you know, staffing, donations to charities, uh, mandatory donations, I should say. Um, certain, yeah, right? <laughs> free, love, free love offering. Yeah, I mean, yes. you know, I don't, I'd prefer to keep it positive, but it, that's just, I would say I've seen the HCAs since the news came down about the HCAs not being fair and people starting to look into them, I've seen the HCAs become more fair. Um, or even in the process when, when, and you know, so my, keep in mind my sample size is three. Um, so what we've seen, and then, you know, through what we've talked with other people, um, I've seen that where they were fair was, you know, we were lucky in a lot of the towns that I personally was working in, they, the, the town lawyer or town legal counsel was kind of looking at where, where the future of this was going when they started hearing about some of this stuff and they, they decided that it wasn't worth the risk to, to get a few extra tens of thousands of dollars in the chance that down the road someone turns around and hires a legal firm and tries to negate the HCA saying it wasn't fair or something like that. Um, but I, I don't, I mean, I don't see any problems with this. Um, I mean, even the zoning's favorable. You guys did right to build in most of the zones. You know, that's, that's very uncommon. Um, you know, I, Caroline's Cannabis here, I'm sure they can talk to you about how the zoning hasn't been <laughs> favorable in, in a lot of locations. Um, I've certainly experienced that myself, uh, but, it, you know, it's, I mean, it's here, it, you know, it's not going anywhere, you know, we just try to do everything right and make sure that everyone has a good experience, and I think that will help the town, and it obviously helps the bottom line. I don't think that we have anything put together to sign off on tonight as pertains to a so, no. post community agreement and I know the last folks that were in front of us we still ended up having I think you sat down with them yeah 
to go over one. So I would probably ask that we just kind of follow that same yeah. protocol. Right, we're just going to use that as a template, I would assume, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when Matt, when we talked, you know, our name isn't on. We, I mean, we saw that it was pretty much the same, you know. You're not going to, and I wouldn't want that, you know, because I, I, in the towns that I've opened, there's been the bigger guys, and then there, when I started off, there was the big guys and then us. And, you know, they obviously had a lot more leverage at those points, and, and I fought really hard for, you know, what they call, like, equal, I think it's equal nations clause. Basically, whatever you sign, like, everyone else should have the same clause. And yeah. so I think that, that What's clause is... favorite nation? Favorite yeah, nation. Most favorite nation status, right? Yeah, oh, thank you. Pull that one yeah. out of my desk. <laughs> it's a little... It's, it's passe now. With, you may put anyway. some big tariffs on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like, you know, I get it. I think it's a fair... Like I said, I think it's a fair HCA. We're ready to sign immediately. We have an LOI. Um, with Rob, we could probably, you know, get this all together and, and move forward within a few weeks into the state and just get into the queue. I mean, the important thing is getting into the queue. Um, and then, you know, it's it's just on you to make sure that you cross your I, or cross cross your T's and dot your I's. Uh, no, it's not cool. Who's the, who's the counsel that we had that helped us write that? Kate Federoff. Okay, yeah, so we'd more probably want to have her. Oh, well, yeah. Shouldn't be a lot of work on her part. Yeah, I mean, you can, we can, you know, just provide the documentation, but you, you can tell your legal counsel that we, um, there's no revisions needed. Okay. And, the, and then they'll just, yeah. yeah, you just say there's no revisions needed, and then they just ask for the name, and this guy signs on the dotted line and yeah. have it. Sign your life. Have fun. <laughs> and, you're, and you're a Douglas resident? Um, I'm not a Douglas no. resident. Okay. Natick. Natick president. He would have been on the agenda if he was a Douglas Ranch president. Well, Jesus. In fairness to Suzanne, I did say that you. Thank you. You, 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 can, you, can, you guys are you tough. <laughs> I, can only give you what I have, and if I don't have it, you don't get it. All right. Um, just a question on scheduling. What do we need to do? Do we need to have them back in, or? Yeah, we'd want to get the document put together, have him right. come back in. We don't need to be meeting for that, and then we just right. vote on it at the next public meeting. It should be the 21st. Okay. Did okay. we authorize yeah. you to sign? Would you, so today's the 4th. If there's agenda. 14 days, would you prefer? You want it on a, the next agenda? Is that what you're saying? I don't. Or you just want to have you want him to sign? authorize Matt to sign? Yeah, we can authorize oh, yeah. Matt to sign That's on That's better. It. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just attach the So are you guys voting then for the town manager to negotiate or? What do they call it? Some to sign it because at this yeah. point, it just a signatory. I don't think there's much negotiation. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> we accept. I think we just have <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. Messengers out of work. Yeah. Yeah. No mass. <laughs> no mass. <laughs> Just a question on the uh, the bigger universe or question with uh, this. We have as a town roughly three licenses that we can give out. I think you wrote three into right. the bylaw. That's so, my memory. Yeah. yeah. So. So this would be number two. Well, is this by default an agreement that the license would come, or do we hand out HCAs to anyone and everyone and let the the HCAs the come on through, and then he's got to go through the permitting process. No, I know. So if people come next week or two weeks from now. It's not up to us necessarily to. Well, I don't think it would be fair practice for us to no, enter right. into more HCAs than what we have for licensing. So we'd have room to do an additional HCA past this right. one. I didn't go to business school, but I would say that's a very bad idea. Yeah. And so I don't have to. Have time. Yeah. I like to overbook <laughs> seats all the time, but I wouldn't like be in favor of letting anyone leapfrog in front of these gentlemen no. either. Right. I mean, they've come in but and that's made But that's up to the state, though. There's a whole bunch of. <clears throat> different levers that have well, to be they pulled. have to do their work with the state we're yeah. just talking about our HCA yeah they've, they've come in and they've asked for our HCA and I the general impression I got here is that we're going to approve yeah the state the state just you know in the end you still have to get approval with the towns which is why there's the HCA right which is why there's special permitting typically uh, you know so it's not like you can just like go to the state without any consultation with the town to show up and because this isn't sitting in one of the zones, they're gonna have to go in front of the ZBA as well. So to get special permission. So yeah, that's why. So that's why. And again, because they're two independent authorities, that's why we can do them concurrently. Right. So that's why when I, when I was talking to Matt, I was like, we just need to get into the states. Right. And, and so 
and then from there. I mean, ICR task is just approving the HCA. Yeah. If we're going to go more or less letter for letter, word for word, on the one we already approved, that makes it easy. Yeah. And this will take care of the details, but. You know, and then the note is, is we have one additional one that we can approve past this, and then it's waiting to see, does it actually go to permitting? Do they actually get a building? So if that ends up falling off, like if the Cannabis Commission comes in and says, hey, sorry, guys, you know, yeah. you're not, right. we don't want it to work that way, then we pull that back, shred that HCA, and move to... And there's towns, I mean, there's towns where they, they're doing that or done that. You know, there's either people who've gotten in trouble or something right. fell through. But yeah. we've Just taken great burden with the state. Yeah, I mean, if right. you look at the application, there's like there's like something like a thousand pen, you know, ap incomplete applications. So there's a lot of people trying to do it. A lot of people don't go through. I can I, see that we've taken a lot of care to make sure that what we're doing is uniform and no, it's we're following it along to make it a seamless process or yeah, as easy as we can. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but I think at least as far as we are tonight, we just take one at a time. Yeah, and if if something were to happen and and anybody we approve. We're unable to gain state uh, regulatory authority or unable to get CBA authority anything yeah. at all. Then at that point, at some point, it would either become obvious to us, or you would come. I don't mean you. Yeah. Any applicant would come back to us and say, "Hey, sorry, this isn't going to work." Yeah. And at that point, we have another license to award. Yeah. yeah. If we choose. Yeah. No, this is not a discussion or a reflection on you guys exactly. at all. I think yeah, you're great. I'm just trying to, that. as I sit no, here, no, no. I don't hear It's enough. like you guys are having Somebody. an open discussion or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've sat here two years, you know, when something happens two years ago, I'd be like, oh, that's the vote which triggered this. So I'm just thinking. So in effect, we have giving our license to these gentlemen. Up I think, the assuming point. we take a vote later tonight, yeah. I think we're provisionally giving a license to these gentlemen. They have the hoops to jump through and they know what they are. So what and unless and until we learn that they're unable to jump through all of those hoops, then that license is... Wait a minute. We're not actually issuing a license. No. We're just no, entering into a, a yeah, post-community yeah. agreement. You're basically issuing a right yeah. to allow yeah. us to, to submit to the state. Yeah. Right. But, you're but, tied to a location. So if the zoning board isn't favorably disposed on the special permit. I think that ends it. Yes. Or a year and a half happens and they're stagnant with the state. We've got other people that are really eager and got their ducks think, in a row. Yeah, right. Yeah. So right. the special Is there permit. a shelf life on this HCA or? I think those are things we can probably work out. I mean, you'd be able to enforce come. those hooks probably through the special permitting. Which, you yeah, know, if, if this just starts them in the process. Yeah, right. I'm not. I'm not trying to negotiate myself out of this. The point is, that I'm trying to. <laughs> what, what I'm trying to say is, you know, it's not like we end up in the queue and all of a sudden, like we steamroll. There's ways to still remove people because of your local zoning process. All right. You know, so if people are sitting on it or whatever, you know. So all we'd really be asking for tonight is a motion to allow Matt to be the signatory on a host community agreement once it's been drafted and is acceptable to all parties. Is that how we should word it? Should there be any further review by the board? I think you should word it that there wouldn't be any changes. Yeah. <clears throat> Understanding that there would be no changes. To our template. To your template. Authorize me to sign it and then it's just a ministerial task. We're going to make any changes to the language. I think I, I wouldn't feel comfortable. Yeah. I have to go back to you. All right. I would move that we empower our attorney to prepare an HCA for the gentlemen that are before us that would have no substantive changes from the other HCA we approved and uh, give Matt signatory authority over that. Second. You're frowning. Is that all right? Well, I frown naturally. It's okay. my natural state of existence. Motion's been made and seconded. It was decent. <laughs> you could have done better, right? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. You'll get the chance. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. 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 Cool. All set. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. Good luck. Do you need us to stick around or? No, we're no. good. Okay. Yeah, we're good. All right, the public safety budget discussion. And we have our, both of our illustrious chiefs here this evening. Mr. Chairman, before you get started, I just kind of want a word about process. <clears throat> FinCom is going to be scheduling these 
budget meetings with our department heads as we go through this month next and early March. My preference is that they present to you first because ultimately the budget, when it is finalized, will be the selectmen's budget submitted to FinCom for a review as a document in its entirety. We're not able to make all those trade-offs yet. We're still gathering information on major accounts. But in order to be timely, we have to get the process rolling. But this is the way I would like to do it because you have the opportunity to give feedback to the department head. The department head can interact with you and we can decide whether any revision would be necessary before they go to FinCom, which is a little bit more formal setting. So that's, we'll roll this out. You'll always be a week ahead of FinCom with your department heads. Okay. I'll you don't have it. to take a vote tonight, but anything that you, pops out at you as something that you want to work on, then we should have a week to do that. Oh, that makes sense. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Are you a movie star today? Not a movie star. Not a movie star today? <laughs> yeah. When any TV station asks me for a statement, I tell them I have a face for radio. <laughs> and I respectfully decline, but they're very... Uh, you look good. Uh, yeah, thank you. That was nice work. Thanks. Yeah, it was uh, just to get started on that. Um, we had the investigation yesterday, which with a little bit of luck and some good police work and a good dog, yep. we were able to make an arrest fairly quickly. So we're still in the process of investigating, but uh, I think we'll have this one wrapped up by the end of the day tomorrow. So I, I have to ask, well. did the dog get a bite? I was just going to say. The dog eat. Yep. The, the, dog, <laughs> the dog ate. The dog got his toy. Yeah. <laughs> My day has been made. Yeah. yeah. A walking toy. Uh, good boy. I have a sneaking suspicion that there was a, probably a long list of priors sitting there. Um, yeah, there's uh, quite a history. Yeah. So, it'll be out of work for a while. But, it's good for us. <laughs> so, um, just a brief overview, overview of the budget. There's really not a whole lot of change. Um, the police department budget is basically three components, salaries, expenses, and the cruisers. You'll remember last year uh, we made an adjustment to the cruiser line item because they were making a change in the years of cruisers. So instead of buying two like we were set up for, we ended up buying a third. So in 2018, we replaced three. Last year, we replaced three. I'm sorry, nine, eight, yeah. So we have three 18s now and three 19s, so the last two fiscal years. So we shouldn't have to talk about cruises till 2024 when we get back on the 2-2-2 two, two, and two track, which will be good. And because there were new models this year when we replaced those three and three, we replaced the equipment. So we should get another cycle out of this equipment. You usually get two cycles out of each cruiser exchange because the models change and the equipment obviously changes, whether it's cages in the back of the car or whatever. So. I'm content that we're going to be good at least until 2024. We get the 100,000 mile, five year warranties. A lot of the major repairs right now are covered under warranty, so it's basic maintenance that we have to worry about oil changes, tires, stuff like that, but brake jobs, but nothing major. So I'm confident until 2024 we'll be good. So that's going to decrease our budget compared to last year's a little bit, but. Um, Going to this one, full-time staff is the same, part-time staff is the same. We have 30 employees overall, 15 full-time officers with myself and the lieutenant, uh, four full-time dispatchers, so 19 full-time employees, uh, six part-time officers, I'm sorry, five part-time officers and six part-time dispatchers, so 11 part-time people. On the salary side of the budget, um, there's a total of eight accounts or line items in the salary side. That whole salary side is dictated by uh, contract and um, the personnel bylaw, whatever the uh, public safety compensation plan is for the uh, full-time dispatchers and the part-time dispatchers. So um, with the contract increases, the salary side um, compared to this year budget is going to go up um, just about 3.4%. And that includes... Um, in it a 1.75 percent increase in salaries and then there was an additional bump for accreditation of a one percent overall in october of this year we achieved the certified status in the accreditation process which is the first part 
of um, finalizing that. In March, we'll be going for full accreditation, and I expect we'll hear on that by July 1st at the latest of the next fiscal year. Um, so it's basically a 2.75% increase in the salaries, but there's also, with that, it changes the uh, overtime rate, so you have to account for that. Um, and there's also, I anticipate, a $4,000 increase in the uh, educational incentive line, which brings the salary side up about 3.4%. Um, if we move down to expenses, um, the expenses total from this year is up 1.5%. Um, there's approximately 25 accounts or line items in that expense side of the budget. Um, with you know five of those alone add up to about $95,000, which is about 61% of the budget just in, in five of those accounts, which is repairs, training, our RMS software, fuel, and dues and membership, which some of those things in that line item are contractual as well. So in FY18, um, our expense side, there was a surplus at the end of the year of about $1,058. And in FY19, there was a surplus of about 1152 And right now at this point, at halfway through the year, I'm, I'm just under 50% salaries and um, expenses so we're right where we should be so there's there's obviously there's not a lot of room and if you look at the last two years and you look historically really what's left in that expense side of the budget there's not a lot of fat you're looking at one serious um you know cruiser repair right there that would eat up that surplus of one thousand or whatever it is so there's um we looked at adjusting some of those accounts and we came up with a basically a 1.5 percent increase should keep us right exactly where we need to be with the expenses. Um, the uh, cruiser side, obviously, last year there was 122,500. That was for the three cruisers. So this year, that's bottomed out. That's going to be zero. Um, so the bottom line with salaries, expenses, zero cruises this year. We're asking for 1,794,238, which is about. 3.5% less than last year, but that one big chunk is the, is the cruisers. So you're going to have a, a substantial increase when you get back to 2024. You're going to see, like, probably <coughs> by that time, close to $95,000, $100,000 increase for those two cruisers, you know, give or take. Mm -hmm. So there'll be quite a jump there. But I don't expect the way things have been going in the past, if fuel stays where it's at, we average about 14,000 gallons a year. If fuel stays where it is, um, I don't see us, you know, having to ask for more than the, you know, the average 1.5 to 2 percent increase in the expenses. It, it's just inflation and how things go up. It's, you know, one thing goes down, one thing goes up. You know, we we got a good deal on our uh, cell service that goes down a little bit. Then something else always seems to go up when something goes down. So we're never really getting ahead. But that's a quick rundown. I can answer any questions that you have. Matt, the food line, the food line, food line item. That's all McLaughlin, isn't it? Uh, he doesn't get much. I, he'd love to have some, but Gene doesn't. <laughs> no, that's uh, Gene's. Yeah, very. Yeah, those are for our um, guests. <laughs> what, do our, what, what do our guests get? Is it McDonald's? Well, they have their choice. Oh, Depends on what time is. They have uh, a choice from Douglas House of Pizza or the Gregory's, or in the morning they can get something from the Coffee Bean. It's not bad. Yeah. No, like oh, 2 a.m. McDonald's run no, from if they no. know. We're very, we like to provide structure where we're from, so <laughs> three squares a day. <laughs> we don't like to stray. Uh, in the other accounts in the expense side, you can look, uh, obviously, they're pretty straightforward, they're pretty self explanatory. Again, we, we go back every couple of years, we keep track of everything that we spend out of each account, and we try to. It what really matters is the obviously you stay within the bottom line, but every account is pretty much spot on um, where it should be. The only thing I usually worry about a little bit is the fuel. You know, remember those years where we went in? I think we were probably at 240 when we budgeted it or something, and we were up over three to, three bucks. Three bucks. Yeah. So Plus silly things like that can happen, happens. but 
Um, since I've been here, going on 24 years and working with Chief Foley, and since I've been in on the budget process, we've never had to come back uh, to the Finance Committee or the Board of Selectmen and ask for more money. We always live within the budget. Um, um, and the expense side is tight, but um, it gets us through. questions on it. It looks pretty straight. I think you do a great job of what we give you, so thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. I have no questions on the budget, do you? Are you happy with the training? Do we have enough ammunition for practice? And <coughs> I'll be honest with you, and, and Mr. Wojcik and I talked about it the other day, you can, you can never have enough training in this job because something is always coming up. There's different areas. There's mental health. There's new classes coming out. We have a lot of people that are specialists in what they do. We have, we have people on the SWAT team. We have accident reconstructionists. We have firearms instructors. We have firearm armorers. Some of these courses can cost upwards to $500 to $750. So what we've been doing the past couple of years is uh, a lot of our training is online, so we get our hours in. Every officer is mandatory has to have 40 hours of training. That's what the state says that you have to have. You have to have 40 hours, but they have certain required things that we take online. But again, we do our firearms. Instead of qualifying twice a year, we, we go out three times, we try to get out four times. But that's a good point, because every time we go out, that's more money in ammunition and time. You just can't do it with the schedule. You can't get 19 people to the range in one day, so you have to space it out. Someone's got to be at work. Someone's got to be on shift. So yeah, we discussed that. Training can always be higher, but we're getting everybody what they need at this point. We're, we're doing a lot of the online stuff, uh, a lot of the in-service online. And um, we bring in the, uh, for firearms, we'll bring in the Blue Line trailer. I don't know if you've seen it out there, but Matt's seen it and Suzanne's heard it. I've heard it. A lot of problems <laughs> going on in the parking lot, but um, it could be higher, but we're getting everybody what they need. So in the... All your officers, their weapons are all still in good shape. No retooling needed at this time. Weapons right? are in good shape. We replaced the vest last year. We got $13,000 through the state and federal, and whatever we didn't have enough for, we paid out of our asset forfeiture account, which was like a couple thousand dollars, but still that we got the federal and state grant. Um, the weapons were on capital, I believe, in not this fiscal year, the following fiscal year, and they were replaced about eight years ago, so we're, we're spot on with that as well um, and that's usually believe it or not it's usually not that big of a big ticket item because we trade in what we have and you know being a municipality you get a really good deal on the firearm so I think if we have that on capital I'm pretty confident that we'll uh, get the nod cool. Excellent. thank you very much Chief. thank you very much <coughs> thank you Fire Chief. Good evening, everyone. How are you all? Really nice to see everyone tonight. Did you did you all get a copy of uh, the presentation? Uh, all right, good, awesome. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I know it uh, came a little later in the day, so my apologies for that. <laughs> <coughs> that is actually called out on. Who would have blamed Suzanne anyway? Exactly. So. I know Kevin would have. Oh, exactly. Falling <laughs> past practice, yeah. Uh, yeah, just wanted to go over the budget with you. Um, not much has changed as, as for the uh, fire department or the ambulance department as well. Um, wanted to go over what we have for staffing. Uh, right now we have uh, myself, one time, one full-time fire chief and uh, also a paramedic, one deputy chief and EMT basic, that's uh, Deputy Ferno. Um, two call captains, one's an EMT basic and one's an EMT paramedic. I have three full-time lieutenants, two are paramedics and one is a basic. Uh, two call lieutenants, one's an EM EMT uh, basic and one's a first responder. We have eight call firefighters, five of them are EMT uh, basics. We have three per diem basics that are on the roster. 
two probationary firefighters. In other words, they can't go in burning buildings or they can come to the scene as long as they're with an officer and what, but they haven't been to the fire academy yet. And obviously our, uh, my right hand, uh, my administrative assistant, Lisa, so. Um, for for um, activity for 2019, um, 346 fire calls of all different various, from structure fires to car accidents, numerous car accidents, uh, you name it, um, we probably see it. Um, ambulance calls, EMS, uh, 799 for the year. Uh, it's a little down from the past couple of years. That's actually up from last year and down from two years ago. Um, it just goes to show you that our, our call volume can fluctuate somewhat. Uh, EMS mutual aid to surrounding towns. 41 times over 2019, other towns called us for an ambulance. Um, and again, we had an ambulance out of service for almost a year. Um, and so we asked for mutual aid from other towns 67 times. So <coughs> I understand that safety is the most important thing, but that's, that's almost, that's between 100 and $125,000 of revenue we weren't able to bill out because of that. But most importantly is that that's a longer response because an ambulance is coming from another town. Um, so <clears throat> we have two new ambulances. Our fleet is up to snuff. That's for the first time in my career. Um, we have an ambulance that's a year old now. We got our ambulance that the state helped us with, uh, Senator Fatman. I know that you tried to contact him. I haven't heard back from him. I'm gonna try to contact him again for another photo op because we're very appreciative that the state helped us out with that. Um, and it's, our one that's a year old is in at Place Motors right now for warranty work because it's already got a, an oil leak in, in the gas in the oil pan and a heater coil leak. But that's, it's all warranty work, it's, it's to be expected. And it did a lot of work for one ambulance over the past year, so we're uh, certainly appreciative of that. As far as fire salaries, um, our fire salaries are $415,000 in, uh, in 320, 415, 320. Uh, it's up a little bit. We did have, we lost one basic um, and we replaced him with a paramedic. So that's, that's $15,000 more a year. So that's a little bit of a jump. Um, but with the staffing, and we've got a, a gentleman that's out IOD, so it was difficult for us to cover shifts when we, when we had some basics. So in my opinion, having that extra medic and having the medic medic is uh, something that works much better for us. Um, but um, we're not quite where we want to be, but um, certainly we're, pre we're, we're thankful that we were able to, to upgrade that position. Um, let's see what other changes were there in there. We cut the we cut the part time a little bit. Actually, that's on EMS side. Uh, so there's an increase in the uh, in the salaries for uh, basically with uh, colas and and steps that are contract of thirty seven thousand and fifty three uh, dollars. Uh, as far as expenses, uh, we were one hundred fourteen two fifty three last year. This this year we're requesting one hundred twenty six. Uh, 369, which is an increase of $12,116. I'll go through some of that with you. Um, the first one was uh, for maintenance contracts. We did have to increase that one a $1,000 because we now have a maintenance contract with the boiler for the fire department, the, uh, the furnace. Uh, we, would, we would have it serviced, but we want to make sure that we're under, under agreement and that we, uh, we're doing that on a yearly basis. Uh, and, and that, that uh, contract costs us $1,000 a year. Uh, if you go down to 53800, other services, <clears throat> we increased that um, $3,000. And other services, that increase is, uh, is so that we can test our holes annually. We've been doing it in-house for years, but it's, uh, with the amount of staffing we have, it's just not logistically possible. You get all the hose stretched out, you get it charged up, the engine running, you get an ambulance call, you gotta leave, and that's not very good. And the other thing is, none of us have really ever been formally trained and certified on how to test hose, and we don't know, we've got a, a hose tester that's like 20 years old, 
we don't know that that's ever been calibrated. <laughs> so we'd rather have a company come in in one day. And this is something that's required by ISO to keep our insurance rates down. We're, we're at a very good position where we have a, a good ISO rating now. We want to keep it that way. <coughs> so that's required annually to do that by the ISO. And also NFPA 1561 requires that. And it's the standard for... Uh, for annual inspection and testing of uh, of hose, and again, that's so that when you're not, you're at a fire, hose doesn't burst, and all of a sudden the fire guys are inside and they have no water because the hose burst because we didn't check it. So, it's definitely something that's good for the town to do and make sure that we're checking. Uh, next, we have uh, a five five eight one one is uniforms. Uh, we went up on that. Uh, let's see here. We went up on that $2,500 on the fire side, and you'll see when we get the ambulance, we went up on that from the, from the ambulance side. And we'll talk about that because um, we're gonna get into some of the logistics of uh, the call firefighters and uh, making them feel part of the team, um, making sure they have uniforms so that they match everybody else. Not to be worse than being on the team, and yeah, yeah but you don't get a uniform. It's a little bit <laughs> demotivating. So, so we wanna make sure that that was a request that we asked for. Um, and the other thing was, um, there are calls where you don't, we're not wearing turnout gear, but you want, you're on the highway, so you want to have a high visibility, good coat that's able to be seen, and you're in, protected from inclement weather as well. So we tried to uh, cover that on both sides, on both sides of the budget. Also, training, um, training, travel uh, for training. The way it's always worked is. When, when we send a call firefighter to the fire academy, they've never been paid for the hours that they're there. It's a 220 hour course, they haven't been paid. Stowe is a good distance away. They've never been paid for training, so we thought it would, it would be advantageous to put some money into training so that they would get mileage for when they went. I know if a, if a full-time firefighter goes to the academy, they get mileage both ways and when, where they go. So we wanna make it, uh, make the playing field level there as well and make sure that um, those things are covered. That's for the call guys. <clears throat> call guys. Yep. Um, that'll that will that'll cover both. Because if we send someone through to full time academy, but if you send a couple of guys um, to the call academy too, I mean, fifteen hundred dollars should cover all that train, all that travel for the year. I would. How I would is our say. call team th these days? Pardon me. How is our call team? Are we? We're going to talk about that a little bit when we get <laughs> further on down, but. Um, I, I, will, I will definitely answer that question for you. <laughs> um, replacement equipment, an increase of $6,500 for, for turnout gear. We got, um, remember when we got that $165,000 from Wallam Lake, we got some gear then. We also got some gear through an AFG grant through the uh, federal government a few years ago. We've had some turnover. We, um, we had some firefighters and medics that get trained and then go to a town for more money or a better schedule or whatever. Now you have gear, you've paid for gear for them, you gotta find someone else to fit it. Um, and you also wanna continually rotate your gear around. It has a 10 year expiration date. But um, I've, I've had two sets of gear in, in the budget. I've already gone, I've already fit like three or four guys this year for gear because of turnover. So I added a little bit there uh, to try to cover us as far as that goes. On the ambulance side, oh, so uh, I should uh, read, the, read the total. The total for fire, both fire um, expenses and uh, salaries will be four, uh, 541689 is uh, what our request is uh, thus far. As far as the ambulance goes, um, not a whole lot of changes there either. Uh, 323921 as compared to 329 last year, that went down because we cut the call salaries. Um, uh, for the call uh, ambulance, um, and that's really about the only change there. So it's down fifty-seven hundred dollars. Uh, as far as the expenses, we we did uh, go up uh, five thousand eight hundred and twenty-nine dollars. The increase, number one, our first increase was for medical supplies. Very recently, at one point, Milford Milford Hospital tried to they they started they phased it in. First, they said, well, we're not going to cover any any medi medications for a cardiac arrest. You're gonna to have to pay for those. And then all of a sudden, after that went for a year or so, or a year or two, <clears throat> they sort of out of the blue just said, oh, oh, we're charging you for everything now. <laughs> so 
we saw a little bit of an uptick in our in our, uh, our medication part of our medical supplies. So we added two thousand dollars there because we had already negged it this year, but we had money in, in other areas of our medical, but we negged it there, so we wanted to make sure that we, we uh, beefed that up a little bit so that we uh, had no problem with our medications. And as I mentioned um, before, we upped the uh, uniform, so there's the other $2,500 on, uh, on the ambulance side. We took 2500 asked for 2500 on the ambulance side and 2500 on the fire side. So uh, the increases with, for the ambulance budget, uh, for this year, 423, 163 with uh, expenses and um, uh, salaries. And then finally, on the civil defense side, which is our emergency management, we've joined a Blackstone Valley Emergency Regional Group, which is a number of uh, emergency managers in the area from different towns. We meet over in Grafton. It's, uh, I think Uxbridge is part of it, Upton's part of it, Northbridge, Grafton. <clears throat> and we have an emergency management board. Uh, what we have to have is a, a local emergency planning uh, team. But what we've done is we've merged a bunch of towns. We, we're trying to leverage grant money that way so that we can spread it out. Uh, we have a CERT team that doesn't have high visibility raincoats or anything like that. So these are things that why we thought it was beneficial to get in a group like this. And the dues for that is $500. So we just added $500 onto, the, uh, onto that side uh, for emergency management. The one other thing I put bold here, um, in bold was, uh, please remember to notice that in our five-year budget, I had asked for a paramedic or, fire or EMT basic, knowing it probably was, wasn't going to be funded. But I keep it there just to document that I've asked for it all along. Um, and uh, there are some challenges on, on the uh, fire department side that I feel that I must bring to your attention, uh, to, to the attention of the board and also the administrator. And the administrator and I, and I think Kevin had met with uh, one of our call captains. As you know, for years, the call fire department's been the backbone of the uh, Douglas Fire Department and has continued to reinforce our full-time operation. However, there's a growing trend that's getting more and more difficult to recruit and retrain call firefighters and EMTs. I think my first nine years here, I put about 10 people through the call firefighter uh, program at the fire academy. In two years, I haven't had one person that's made it or has been on the fire department long enough to actually send them to the academy. They're just, they're not coming in the door. And it's really not Douglas, it's just a nationwide trend. Um, and what, what I'm finding is it's a growing challenge for call firefighters to, ju to juggle family commitments, with their, you know, sports, sports on Sundays, Saturday mornings, evenings. They're at games. They have other time constraints, and quite frankly, uh, it's getting to the point where the fire service isn't a place that people want to be anymore. They see that there's a, can a, high, a huge cancer risk there. They're seeing a rise in suicides of firefighters. They're seeing a rise in just danger and, and just the things that we're exposed to. They. People are just like, yeah, I'm out. I'm, I'm not up for that. So we're seeing that that's a trend. And so um, we want to do what we can to try to, to, to try to nip that in the bud and, and help our, our call guys out. Um, it just, I'm finding that it, it's more and more that they're not, they're not able to, they're not available. So if you get an ambulance that goes out and you have a crash, it's difficult to get an engine out to support them and make the scene safe, whether it be blocking the scene, making sure the battery's disconnected on the car, and it, or, or to fight a fire. Um, it's, it's sort of helter skelter. You, we want to make sure that we have th that staffing, and the staffing is dwindling. Um, so we're going to do everything we possibly can to address the situation. Uh, I know other towns are having the same problem. Um, got some ideas. Talk to the some of the full timers about. Talk to some of the call guys about an open house and about uh, about a, a recruitment a recruitment program, an open house. So those are some things that are, that are uh, that we're we're trying to do. But some other things that we we thought we'd ref, that we reflected in the re request in meeting with some of the call members, some things that they had asked for was <clears throat> number one a pay to be paid in increments of one hour. Right now, if you get a, if, if we go out and we get a, say it's a carbon monoxide call, and I get there and I deem, you know, 
well, that's a, it's a call, false call. You can hold the engine in quarters. Well, they come to the fire station, they come from their home 15 minutes and say, okay, hold in quarters. They get paid for 15 minutes. They're not paid for an hour, they're paid for 15 minutes or half an hour. Um, uh, also, something we thought might be good is we'll set a time on the overnight uh, and do two hour, a two-hour two hour minimum. Uh, if a guy comes out, he gets a, a minimum of two hours. The, uh, what they make, if a, if a full-time member comes back, they might come back for a training and get time and a half, but what these guys get in, an hour, in, in two hours might, not be, might be what they get in just an hour. So we're trying to level the playing field and make it uh, a little bit more motivating as far as that goes, too. Also, uh, the clock would start when they leave home. I don't see that that's really much of a difference. Uh, rate change ver verification to reflect one rate. <clears throat> I've talked about this to the town administrator and Kevin as well. For the longest time, um, we have two rates, or some have two rates. So if you take a person who's a captain on the fire, on the fire side, trained, uh, certified firefighter, and a captain, uh, and then they're a paramedic, say they respond on the engine, they respond on the engine, we get to a crash, find out, oh, we got a person that's really injured, we're gonna need an extra hand in the back of the ambulance, move them over to the ambulance. They get paid at a higher rate on the ambulance, but they came on the engine, so they're getting fire pay. <laughs> so I think, personally, they ought to be paid for the highest level that they're trained at, m monetarily. So if they're a paramedic and they get $3 more as a paramedic, that's what they ought to be paid for across the board. Um, so that was something that we'd have to go to. We'd have to come up with a, a new a new pay scale through the personnel board and myself and and Mr. Wojcik, uh, and that would have to go to town meeting. But it's something I want to certainly bring up. Uh, also, duty uniforms. Um, it's always been well, well. We'll try to throw you a shirt or something like that. But to try to put something in the budget where when a call fighter comes, firefighter comes on, he gets two pairs of pants, he gets two uniforms, and then after five years, if he's been here five years, then we can, we can buy him a Class A uniform. So that if we go to a funeral or we go to some event, as a department, everyone looks the same and, you know, they look professional. So those are some things that we, uh, we had talked about. That's really it as far as the, uh, as far as the call guys go, um, the call firefighters. Um, I'll just weigh in on the, um, they should be that hourly um, idea, right? Our video videographers, they're great, right? They can sit through a 15 minute recreation commission and get paid for three. So I would really kind of like mm. to see something there. It has to be an incentive to get up out of bed in the middle of the night below. I mean, when we had the fire um, up here on Depot Street, it was, that was dicey. Okay, I had 12 guys and they got a ton of work done. I was never more proud of them. Um, so when the rubber meets the road and we get something really bad, people are there. But there's times like during the day, um, if the ambulance goes out and we get a fire call, sometimes it's me, I'm thankful to have John and Adam over at the highway. If I didn't have them, I'd be up the creek without a paddle. I mean, you're calling mutual aid and that's a while. Um, I was just reading an article tonight about uh, sometime down in Middleton, they had a fire and everyone showed up at the selectmen's meeting, we want to increase the fire budget. I just, an article I saw tonight. But um, people, w w when it happens, it hits home and uh, people realize it. But one of the things I, I wanted to, to mention, I sort of like the way this is worded. I'm not sure if any of you know, many of you know of the term cascading effect. But a cascading failures occur when one part of a system fails, or in this case, if firefighters are not available to respond. So therefore, one part of an, an, if, if one part of an interconnected system fails, the whole system fails. So some of the things uh, that, we had, that I've asked for tonight will probably address things temporarily, but they're only a stopgap and they're, all gonna, they're only gonna address things temporarily. What really needs to happen is that um, we need to add more full-time firefighters. And, and when, the, when, the, when the call guys are there to help, they, they're absolutely 100%. But the problem is sometimes they're just not able to be there. And that's something none of us can, <laughs> none of us can control. So we gotta think about that. We gotta think about the vulnerabilities and the safety issues that can, that can be presented with that. So really that's all I have. If, if anybody has any questions on, on the budget, 
mutual aid, does it include any Rhode Island or Connecticut towns? <coughs> It, uh, it does from time to time, especially on the fire side. Yeah. It gets a little bit more difficult with the, with the EMS side because states have different regulations on the EMS side. Certain towns, and, and you get into another, another state where your protocols are completely different, you're relying on your protocols from the state you originate from, but it's really not always the best standard of care both ways, you know what I mean? And it can be, a, it can be confusing. Uh, but as far as fire, absolutely. Um, and we border, we border two states, and we have uh, them on our run cards. Um, and when we get, um, you know, fire department fires or incidents where we, where we um, need extra help, and that, and if I have a first alarm or a second alarm fire, I'm going mutually, because <coughs> even even with what we had up here uh, this past March. We got a lot of work done, but we, we had to go to a three alarm in, in, in short in short time. Twelve guys working for the first that's twelve guys is a good start for a fire at two thirty in the morning. Um, but in the daytime, two guys or three guys, um, you know, we're calling mutual aid right off the bat to get them on the road. Call it automatic mutual aid, you know. If they hear and a lot of us chiefs have we have ears on for what's going on in the other towns. If if I always say if, if you hear me in a bad way, don't wait for me to call, <laughs> just come. <laughs> and then we'll sort it out when we get there. So we have our backs as far as that, that way goes. Thanks, Chief. All right. Thank All you, right. Chief. Okay. Yes. Um, approved class two license renewal for all around auto sales and possible vote. This is the uh, one application or renewal that was not in your packet for all the other renewals. Uh, he did come in finally and give me his application. It is complete. So I ask that you would approve it. And I'll have you sign it later. I move that we approve the application as submitted. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All right. I believe we're on to minutes now, right? A land purchase. Or all oh, those land purchase. Land purchase. I missed that one. This is the one um, that uh, the Department of Fish and Game sent us this uh, notice saying that they are interested in purchasing some land, but they really didn't give us um, any information as to what piece of land it is. We kind of uh, did the best we could to try to figure it out, but we really think that we need to ask them uh, for more information so that we know exactly what piece of land that they are purchasing before you make any recommend or before you do any support letters, letters of support. I would agree with that. All right. So if they can't be specific as to what they're looking for, then we can't support right. them in it. I'll put it on a future agenda if I get if I get the information. Interesting that it's fish and game and not DCR. It's my first in 20 years. 19, Term end 19. run comes to mind. I don't know if that's what you think. Back door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So 20% of the land's in, in Douglas, I guess, and the rest is Webster. Right, that was what yeah. I saw. And when they get us 100% uh, of the information, we'll talk to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get about 1% of the taxes. Point one. All right, so minutes. Well, just as, while well, I'll appreciate the Fishing Games information, uh, are we inclined to do this? Not really. I would not be inclined. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> yeah, making sure you guys certainly are doing your job. Certainly <laughs> open a discussion, but. Yeah. All right. I'm not inclined to talk to anybody. They can't tell us what they're looking to buy. Yeah. So. We're willing to negotiate on an open ended basis on all issues. I would be more than happy to sell them the land at 5,000% above market value. How's that? 
second. Yeah, they need to work on their literacy too, because it's not a track, T R A C K. The yeah. tract of land is yeah. T R A C T. So, 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 so clarify what it is they think they want to buy. Can we also and, send the representative a uh, copy of Hooked on Phonics? <laughs> I feel at home with another grammar specialist seated to the right of me. So. If that's okay. I'm sure our town administrator would be happy to red ink what they'd sent and. The only thing that would make it worse. I'd, I'd be overjoyed. <laughs> the only thing that would make it worse is if it was tracks and they used an apostrophe. That would just that would be, that'd be over the top. Of With it. an inappropriate semicolon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's grounds for like a yeah. full bone coup. Oh, you don't have an inappropriate semicolon. We're on TV for crying out. Yes. Let's not but, talk about but the, it. But the residents liked the last time we had a discussion about semicolons. Right. <laughs> Everybody does. That's it. If I was forced to do stand up, I would do my little bit on semicolons. All right. I'm sure you'd have them roaring, too. Yeah. Do you do that at the planning meetings, the mass planning? I haven't not been asked to do that yet. I'm sure that they, it would make their meetings far more entertaining. All right. Now, can we do the minutes? Anyone? <coughs> Make a motion that we approve the minutes of December 17. And while we're at it, the executive session minutes of that same day, retaining all. Second. All right, the motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. I will abstain. You were being fleeced by a rodent. I believe at the time. But I was in a warmer climate. <laughs> did you go to Star Wars land? I did. Oh, How was now that? I, now I understand. My children were very happy with it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. If they're happy, you're happy. That's it. Your report, Mr. Administrator. <clears throat> I have three quick things for you. I'll do the bad news first. We put together some fantastic grant applications for three major initiatives. <clears throat> One was for a replacement of diesel equipment under the Volkswagen settlement. And we were unsuccessful there. Uh, we were very surprised by that outcome. The truck we were looking to replace is in 1994. Then when we hooked it up to the emissions testing equipment, it blew it up. <laughs> so that's a bad sign. I don't know it's if we can make a stronger case. Equipment. Um, said carbon footprint infinite. Yeah, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, sometimes the bureaucrats in Boston they get real focused on their policy-driven analysis of these grant applications, and they end up with very strange results. I don't want to burn bridges, but I will say this much: that if the towns of Winchester and Westboro need trucks, then they can take their AAA bond rating and go get themselves a bloody truck. And Douglas, that doesn't have cash growing on the vine, should bump up a couple of steps in the analysis. I just think that if you're really serious about climate change and adjustment, then go to the communities that cannot afford to replace their equipment and let the Winchesters and Westboros of the world buy their own. So, so rational that's my thinking in politics. Shout out to my friends at DEP there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was very surprised to learn that we did not win the ADA grant for the senior center because that was. A fantastic narrative. Patrice worked very hard. That grant comes around every single year, and I think we'll be right back at it next year. Same thing with the truck grant. We'll be right back at it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we're still waiting to hear on the third, which is the IT uh, best practices grant. We did look for the full quarter million there. Is we want to leverage money approved by town meeting for the backup generator to build in the redundancy in cybersecurity that we need for the rest of our network. So we're still holding out hope. I'm referring to the IT guy as Obi-Wan Kenobi because he is my last hope at this point for a nice big grant this year. Um, better news, <clears throat> as you know the supplemental budget was signed by Governor Baker. It was a chapter 90 increase for most municipalities in that. So we're up $36,485. So for a total for fiscal 20 is now 401 333. So we'll take every little bit we can yep. for roads. I recall the last increase was in the hundreds, not the thousands. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> right. 53 cents. 
Lastly, I, th I think you're becoming more accustomed to these ridiculously obtuse <coughs> fiscal notes that I endeavor to write. I think it's a good exercise for all of us because when there's a change in the budget forecast, you need to be able to explain it. If you want to read the two pages, there's a tremendous amount of detail. Long story short is this. When the Massachusetts Strategic Health Group, that's us, Webster and Dudley Charlton Schools, went out to bid for retiree health insurance, which is a benefit year starting January 1st, we got seven bids. We had five carriers. They were allowed to submit more than one bid. They could partner with different front-end customer relations groups, which they did. We got five carriers, seven bids. We were paying $389 per member per month for the most popular of our two plans. It's 101 people versus six people, so it's wildly much more popular. 389 per member per month, and we're down to 291. So this is substantial savings. Changing carrier from Tufts to Aetna and working with retiree first. The even better news is that when they bid that, they locked in their rate for year two. They were willing to commit to a price for year two, which was only a, uh, basically the same rate. Now the federal government has come along and said they're going to eliminate the health insurance fee on Medicare supplemental plans for calendar year 2021. So that's another 5.5% off. So we're locked in right <coughs> now at 274.60 per member per month for fiscal 22. For calendar 21, which will be partially fiscal 21, 22. So this chart in the back here summarizes what we're saving versus what we're paying now, which is about $78,000 in this coming year's budget. But we had projected, because we're very conservative with how we budget, a 6% year-over-year increase on this set of plans because the trend in the market is eight. We get more stability in Medicare because Medicare prices, reimbursements are sticky. But <clears throat> so now when we look at the five-year projection, knowing that we're going to be dropping so far down, our year-over-year -year change is <coughs> 120, 138, 157, 169,000 over the course of these five years just because we, were, have it, we had it going like this and it's going to go like this. That's very good news for the years three, four, and five of the budget projection, because that's a lot of money uh, to save. So this experiment with the strategic health group has certainly really paid off on the retiree side. It's also paying off, I'll, my last thing will be, remember when we went into the self-insurance scheme for our active employees, we said we would be getting rebates back from the pharmaceutical companies that our carrier was keeping in the fully insured model. We got our first check. Was that one quarter or half the year? I don't know the time frame. I think it's the first quarter. I would, I would guess the first. Quarter. So for the first quarter, our rebate was nine, just a little bit under ninety-four thousand dollars. Wow. It doesn't come back to the town. It comes back to the trust. Okay. Right. But that still takes pressure off rate right. increases yeah. because that's the money we already paid. The taxpayers already paid that to provide the benefit. Now it came back to the trust. So, so far so good, knock on wood, it has been a very um, beneficial move to go to the self-insurance model, and the, the group purchase Basically, what, what's the, the retirees and, and regular full-time employees, what's the savings? It's hundreds of thousands of... Well, this year, remember, we yeah. were looking at an 11, and by being self-insured, we only had a 1.4. We're still going to project 6% on that, because we, that's so dependent on our claims experience, and yeah. I hate to try to predict claims. Yeah. What we are noticing, we have a fair amount of data in so far. So we're about six months into this fiscal year, and we are exactly where we should be to have a good year. So we want to end the year at about 85% of our working rate paid out for medical expenses. That would be the target. We started off nice and low, which is where we want to be as a high deductible plan. So for the first quarter, we were at 45% medical loss ratio. We're up in the 60s now, but that's about where we should be we see a lot of activity because we have a high, de high deductible plan in the last two quarters. So we're just holding on, hoping that we end up at 85. But if we end up there, we should be looking at a renewal that's something that we can swallow, a single digit renewal instead of double digits. Getting back to the uh, uh, flatter line or flatter climb on retirees, um, how does that affect our OPEB liability? 
Well, I think it's, it should be reducing. We will. We'll report yeah. that at the end of the year. Okay. We'll do these, these annual adjustments, but it will help. Excellent. As, as well as changing the high deductible. Yeah. Yep. Every yeah. time we make these, these changes, will help us. Good. Our account is going up, though. We're going to go up to 107 next year. Yeah. From 107 to 110. We anticipate three retirements. Nice. And the budget, the five-year forecast builds in. I've, I've built in two a year just because I think that's prudent. And I just I know enough about our roster to know we have a pretty decent group of people at the top step on the teacher side. And we've got some folks here that will probably retire in the next five years. And, we know who they are. I think two years. Recently. We've also made changes to our health insurance policy too, that allows them to get off our plan right. and then one time only, but then come, come back. Come on. back. So, right. so those little changes that we've been making over the last year and a half, as different situations come to us, um, we've been kind of tweaking that policy as well to kind of benefit the town and not hurt the employee. That's all I had, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Okay, we have any old business? Seeing as none, do we have any new business? Again, seeing as none, do we have a very eloquent bone in the motion? We'll do my best. Uh, we make a motion today at this moment to move into executive <laughs> session for the purposes of collecting bargaining and interest in real property. Then we will leave that executive session for the purpose of adjournment. Well put. Thank you. I would second that well, well stated motion. That well stated motion has been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Bona and I. Morse, aye. Davis, aye. Cortez, aye. 